Welcome to Listen In. I'm Brian Gahan, and this podcast focuses on the stories that are buried deep inside all conversations. Be it the kind of conversation you have with someone whose life experience is full of interesting POVs and insights, or the kind of conversation you have inside your own head around your own life experiences. Today in episode 24, I'm talking with the founder of Glenwood Consulting Group, Shona Prasad. As an executive coach specializing in personal presentation skills and style, Shona shares with us the importance of learning effective communication when it comes to building our personal brands and company cultures. We discuss the challenges of presenting in person and online, and she teaches us some valuable tips on how to ensure the message we are sending is the message that's being received. Well, hello, Shona. Welcome to Listen In. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to talk to you. I'm really interested in having this conversation because I would love to dive into your expertise in communication, in how you work with people around developing a personal communication style. But first of all, I would love to sort of get a bit of a background in how did you end up, you know, in front of corporate giants and individuals of all different walks of life, helping them with their personal communication skills? Well, would it be inappropriate to say the whole thing was a happy coincidence? (laughs) (laughs) As life has a tendency to be, right? That's exactly it. There's a plan and then there's life. But this happy accident was was truly a happy accident. Um, I grew up in a very small town. My parents were very, what can I say, flexible with my spirited being and attitude. And come high school, um, theater is really what I wanted to do. Oh. And of course, my father wanted me to have a job. So I was able to merge both both wants and needs and I went into a program which is really niche and it's called drama in education so it's really taking a kid aesthetic approach to learning so most of my my friends and colleagues went into teaching which made a lot of sense and I ended up coming to the city working in in festivals and arts administration so that took me through a couple of festivals here in the city most notably Toronto Film Festival So hang on, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you right there, because I just want to go back to, and I'm not going to say it right, but you said focused on kinesthetic learning? Kinesthetic, kinesthetic learning. So explain what that is. What what does that mean? Okay, so kinesthetic learning is really approach where you're learning by doing. You're learning through action. You're getting up and doing it. Okay. So... So rather than, and this is, this is the absolute backbone of what I use every day with clients because people could read a book mm-hmm. or do an online course, quite frankly, on how to present, but it's somewhat like, you know, reading a book on how to water ski. You, you got to get up, you got to do it, you got to fall, you got to fail, you got to find your balance. You, you, you can't just do it by reading about it. And that's really the whole premise of drama in education and this this approach of kinesthetic learning. Okay, learning by- so so what you're saying is I've never climbed Mount Everest, even though I've read the book about climbing Mount Everest. I get it. But Thanks. that is exactly right. Brian. Okay, yeah. okay. So now you're at the, yeah, so back back to your story. Sorry. So now you're at the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah. So I came to the Toronto Film Festival and I was booking speakers for televised panels and symposiums. So that really meant that I was booking a lot of industry experts and a lot of studio heads. And we were trying to glean what their their insight was to the current trends and where things were, were going. And what we found is we had a lot of, you know, big names and, and well-known folks. Once we got them up on the panel and the lights went on and the camera started to roll, they would do what any normal human being does in some scenarios where they feel uncomfortable and they would freeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then head swung to me and said, Hey, you've got a background in theater. Can you prep these people before they get up? 
So that became a little bit of a sidebar for me. So I did arts administration through TIFF and other festivals here in, in Toronto and New York as well. And that's what I did. I prepped speakers. And in that process, I started to see that it really doesn't matter how smart, how witty, how good looking, what kind of car you drive. If you don't know how to connect and communicate, it doesn't really matter how smart you are because we're not getting the benefit of what you know simply because your your biology is, is, is working against you, essentially. I think the thing that became very real to me very quickly is, you know, people are people. And at its core, people are animals. And so anytime we're under threat and we feel as though we're not safe, then that affects the way we can communicate and and really connect. So again, it really doesn't matter how old you are, what your position is. And I say this even to this day, whether I'm working with C-suite or someone who's entry level, it really doesn't matter if you haven't had the time, experience, and and a guide or a coach to take you through the, through the process to just calm everything down and just find your focus, then, you know, that's a journey that wherever you start, you're going to have to walk. Mm -hmm. And that sort of leads me into a sort of present day situation where a lot of people do to, you know, one, the shifting work environment, but it's also been fast tracked by the pandemic where people are now having to communicate over the internet, in Zoom calls, in all sorts of ways that they're not comfortable with, even if they used to be able to sneak into a, you know, a meeting room and hide in the corner, they're now on screen in, you know, and having to participate by using their language and their voice. So I just find this a very poignant time to have this conversation with you. So that's why I'm so interested in this. Let's go to sort of like, you know, ground zero is like, how does someone's personal communication, whether their skills or habits or just the way they do things, how, how does that all start? And then how do you kind of dissect that? It really starts with helping them gain awareness on how they come across now. So, in, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything before you know where you want to go, you got to know where you're starting from. Right. And this piece is really all about helping people understand what do other people see in them? So whether this is, you know, there's a series of questions around, you know, what kind of feedback have you gotten? What, what kind of, you know, peer conversation have you had? What kind of performance reviews have shared insight into what you may or may not know because here's the beauty of of what's happening between what's what has happened in a more traditional workspace which is everyone you know gets their big jug of coffee and they wander mm -hmm. into the boardroom and you know everyone's doing their thing people can see in you but you aren't always aware of what people are seeing in you the thing that's happening now online is as you're speaking and communicating, you're actually watching yourself. People are feeling like, oh my God, that, that's how I really speak. Like I tilt my head or that's how I use my hands or all of these things, these micro expressions that people naturally have, people are seeing that on screen. So one or two things are happening. People are completely freaked out and they actually either put a post-it note or they put hide screen on their camera or they lean into the fact that, oh, I had no idea I did that. Mm -hmm. So it's that piece of awareness that we really need from the very beginning. And this is what I, I take everything through the lens of what's your executive brand, which is just a fancy way of saying what's your personal brand. Right. Though I don't love everything about Jeff Bezos, <laughs> I will say, because this is his definition, but I will say I love his definition of brand, which is your brand is what people say about you after you leave the room. So the first question I ask clients is, what are people saying about you after you leave the room? Oh, wow. That's, this, that's very powerful. 
Well, and that's, again, where I get a sense of how aware people are. And then the next question, which is even better, is when I say, now, what do you want people to say about you after you leave the room? And it's really the gap in between the brand audit and the definition of brand that is my work. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's the space I play in. So that's really how it all starts. Right. That's fascinating. Now, do you find that there's a lot of people who um, that gap is huge? In other words, their interpretation of what they think they're leaving behind when they leave the room and what others have picked up is, you know, in in your experience, is that like, is it, you know, is it a 20% gap or is it an 80% gap on the average person? Right. You know, I, in most cases, it's not huge. I would say, because, because if we really look at it, someone who is unaware, and I say this with a very kind heart, and I'm, I, I'm also grateful to say that I have seen this very little in my 20 plus years, although I have seen it. Um, people who are deeply unaware are generally people who are fairly arrogant and they, they think quite highly of themselves. Right. And in many cases, not everyone shares that attitude toward that person. <laughs> <laughs> They share the the attitude of, of arrogance, but they don't share the they think a lot about them attitude. So, you know, really the gap in between, I would say, for the for the average, I don't know. I don't think it's anything more than 15 percent, maybe 20 percent. Well, that's hopeful. That's hopeful. It, yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, I think people who are you also have to appreciate the two types of clients that tend to come my way. So there's either, you know, there is the small percentage where there's companies who have um, a lot of development programs for their people, and they tend to to offer a lot of development opportunities. And so here and there, I'm getting people who are in, quote unquote, invited by HR to come in and participate in this style of training. And sometimes I get some real resistance with those folks. And most often, I'm working with people who want to be there. So they're already leaning in. They already know what they're good at and where they're not so great and where there's Mm -hmm. opportunity. In many cases, people are already in before we start. And like anything, Brian, like that makes all the difference. Exactly. Yeah, I guess that's funny because I was thinking of it more from that other group of, you know, you must go and become better. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because everybody thinks you suck. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not projecting. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then there's the, as you say, because that's the thing that comes up for me right away is, um, you know, as somebody who was in the advertising industry, I was in sales, I was in so many sort of, uh, you know, frontward facing businesses. And I've been in so many presentations. Um, I would die just to have somebody help me get better at that because as you said that feeling of fear or fight or flight or whatever happens to us animals when we're in a place where we don't feel safe can be very very debilitating and you know to be able to have somebody help you work through that uh i think would be priceless it would and i i also think it's something that people don't even know exists well yeah it's funny you say that because i've been in many scenarios whether it be you know dinner parties once upon a time or the dog park and people would say what do you do and which is always a bit of a a big a big question and it's probably heard more in the city than others but yeah, it's the it's the whole like, oh, I didn't even know that this job was a thing. And quite frankly, Brian, I didn't either until I started to do it. Right. But it's 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 super niche. And I'm I, I tried very hard to stay in my lane because there are other coaches and consultants that do even variations of this communication stuff that they do it much better than I do. So I really stick to. How do you communicate and make impact with visual, vocal, and verbal? And really from 
the angle of your oral communications. Even folks who come to me and say, oh, can you help me with writing style? Like, no. In fact, when you find someone, please let me know because I could probably use a little bit of help with that too. But it's pretty niche. Welcome back. I'm talking with executive coach Shona Prasad about the simple truth when it comes to effective communication. We're just talking. And the importance of learning how to get out of your own way. Everybody has a fear of public speaking, or most people do. And but we we sort of speak in public a lot when it's not defined as public speaking. Well, that's exactly right, because really, you know, my definition of presenting is every time you open your mouth, you're presenting. In many cases, people who I'm working with who are really, it's quite debilitating for them. And it's a source of of actual anxiety. There's two things that are happening. Number one, I'm always trying to comfort people and say, listen, you're just talking. That's all you're doing. You're just talking. Now, if you're talking in front of a room of 100 people, then sure, you're the one doing the majority of the talking, but you're still trying to connect one-on-one with everyone in that that room. And the other piece for people who are incredibly nervous is to invite people to not think about themselves so much. Because when we're thinking about ourselves, we're judging ourselves, We've got that old, those old tapes running in our head about all the things that people said to us when we were, when we were young or that comment that, our, that grade three teacher told us, you know, when we were making our first presentation with our cue cards about our cat, right? <laughs> and we have all of these old messages in our head telling us why we're not good at this and why we've always been told we're not good at this. You've got to get You've got to get beyond that. And, and I'm not suggesting this is easy, but you really have to, you, you have to get over yourself in order to really see the runway in front of you. So give me an example of, you know, helping somebody get over themselves, because I'll give you an, uh, you know, a personal example is, is that, you know, I, I have done both, you know, I have done presentations that I walk out of and people are just like, oh my God, that was amazing. And I don't necessarily feel like they were good, but every one that I've done that hasn't gone well goes to the core of my insecurity of like, yes, Brian, that's why you suck at this. And right. so... Yeah, so 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 walk me down that path a little bit about how you help people kind of get out of their own way. Well, that's that's easily answered because part of the process that I use is when I am first meeting with somebody, there's obviously a little bit of back and forth and I want to get a sense of who they are and what they want and objectives and those types of things. And then we go straight into the coaching. And so what that means is part of my process is I use camera and on-camera feedback and analysis in order to play back what we can both see in what's good about the client or what needs to be, needs to be, you know, improved upon. Mm -hmm. So I'll give, I'll say, okay, listen, Brian, I want you to chat for 60 to 90 seconds about anything about work that's meaningful to you. So you could be talking about a new project, a new initiative, anything that you have coming up. So I just get you to chat on camera for, like I said, 60 to 90 seconds. We play that back and we play that back with no sound. And the reason we're playing it back with no sound is because 55% of the impression that people get of us is through how we look and the nonverbal. So that's not likely new information to you or anyone listening. But the whole point is over half of the impression comes through the nonverbal. So we want to look back on it nonverbally and say, do we see some of the words that you've identified as part of how you want people to see you? Mm. So that's the first piece. Then the second time around, I'll play the clip and we'll listen to it. And then at the very close of their quote unquote presentation, what I do as standard procedure is I keep the camera rolling. And so we see that person 
and their quote unquote presentation. And then they just turn back into who they are. Mm, yeah. And then I'll say, hey, so what do you think? How'd that go? Is that how you typically would do it? And they would say, yeah, you know, <laughs> I felt like I stumbled here. Or I did that. And all of a sudden the hands are moving and there's lots of inflection and and they're just back to being themselves again. Right. So yeah. as we play that back, then I say, OK, do you see a difference when you were presenting and when you stopped presenting? And that's usually the moment where people go, oh, right. And I can tell you 99% of the time, they are dramatically better in the second take. Because oh, they're just talking. They're themselves. Which is the whole yeah. point. And they're not thinking about themselves because they're thinking about what they did. They're thinking about, you know, the question I just asked them. Therein lies the two points that I'm always making, which is you're just talking and stop <laughs> thinking about yourself. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of sneaky. And if anything, it's like the camera does half my work because I'm like, well, there you are. Welcome back. Where'd you yeah. go? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. 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 Because I, I was on your website and I noticed your, you know, your statement is like, you know, message sent, message received. And I, and, and that I thought was again, very powerful because, you know, in the business world, I'm so used to working with people and also myself where it's all about getting our message sent. Did we tell them everything we needed to tell them? Like, especially mm -hmm. when you do like a new business pitch or something, you walk in the door, you've never met these people, you know, you get in front of them and you start telling them about yourself or your business or whatever. And it's all just sent, 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 sent. And then you walk yeah. out the door and everybody gets in the car and goes, I, I think that went really well. And then your feedback down the road is, oh, we would have liked to have learned more about this or that or whatever. And you learn that what you said didn't get received and that i think is such a dichotomy out there right yeah a hundred percent and i would say that's even more of a challenge with the online right now because there is that i think as a speaker in a traditional presentation mode there's a certain amount of control over we've built the deck we've got the content i have rehearsed it so i know my stuff and then it becomes almost like a little bit of a, a teeny tiny monologue where it just all goes out. So that's that's really a one way mode of communication where your words are going out. The only way this works and this is easier in person and this is our challenge for all of us online is we want to see the nonverbal coming back to us, which says, yeah, hmm, interesting, where people are nodding their head. Or they've got that squint in their eyes that says, hmm, that, that gave me pause for, for thought because I hadn't really seen it from that angle before. Or people are writing notes. Or people are picking up their phone, which is also a message back mm -hmm. that they, you may, may not be hitting the mark. You may not be getting to the point or what is resonating with the other side. So... So when you're speaking, that's simply just a one way. So if you're delivering the information, that's all you're doing is delivering it. There's really no guarantee that people are getting what you're saying. It just means that you said it. That's a great segue into something I wanted to ask you about, which is, is there... Okay, so I, I'm going to go back to presenting in the advertising business again, you know? And there's times where I've walked into presentations and there's a group of people and there's all sorts of different messages coming at you from all different types of people. So somebody is on their phone or I did one presentation once where the client who I had met, who invited us to talk to a larger group to sell them on a concept, scowled at us the entire time we were presenting. So we thought we were doing something wrong. So we were constantly in the back of our brains going like, what's wrong? Like he looks so mad at us and it just turned out to be his resting face. And, and he ended up loving us at the end and congratulating us on doing a great job, but he almost ruined it for us because we're like, you're, you know, I thought you were my ally and you're sitting there scowling at me. So anyways, so how do you, how do you help people, you know, filter through all the different responses they could be getting and not 
again, start to feel that anxiety and fear of I'm screwing up or they're not getting it. Like, how do you calm that the hell down, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I've had I've had the same scenario where I remember years ago, I was at a pharmaceutical company in Montreal. I had about, I think there was probably about 150 people in the room. And I was on my feet for three hours. So it's a, it's a lot of my talks are interactive. So, so there's lots of back and forth and lots of coaching and, and lots of action happening, but it's a long three hours. And this particular session was going really well. We're getting great work done. We're having a laugh. Everything's going tickety boo. And I've got this one woman in the back left-hand corner and she is not loving me which is, you know, which is fine. I'm not for everybody. <laughs> but but at this point, I'm like about hour, hour one of three. Everyone's great. But I'm working for this one lady in the back left. Mm -hmm. Because when these things happen for me, I make it a game where I, I say, okay, what are all the tricks I got in my little bucket here to see if I can't win this one over? So I, I leave it all on the, uh, on the, on the, on the racetrack, as you would say. And at the end of the three hours, who was the very first person who came up to me? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it was incredible. Thank you. I learned so much. And I thought, well, where was the love two hours ago? Right. So, so, so yeah, I mean, number one, it, it's a, it's, it can be very altering and it can throw even the best off their game when you've got somebody who not only is not giving you anything back, but they're giving you somewhat negative back. So there's really, there's a few things that, that I, I suggest people consider. The very first thing is you got to do is you got to breathe because when someone is giving you negative feedback, whether non-verbally or verbally, the very first thing you do is you kick into the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which is those are the four natural states we go into when our amygdala is hijacked and we immediately have a shutdown of the body. And that's what keeps us safe. That's the animal instinct in us is to either stop breathing or we also will engage in this this shallow chest breath, which is like a, <sighs> right? Because mm -hmm. we've got so much adrenaline going through our system and our body is preparing us to run, to flee. So you've got to breathe and you've got to calm the parasympathetic portion of your central nervous system down. You've got to make sure everything kind of comes back to a state of calm. And when that happens your brain and your, your tongue can start working together. And when that happens, then you can start making some good decisions because now you're engaging the prefrontal cortex, which is helping you say, okay, we're in a bit of a situation here where someone's not happy with us. So the first thing you gotta do is you gotta breathe. Somewhere in the second portion of this is you wanna go back to how do I want to come across? In the right. very beginning of this presentation, what did I want? What did I, I say I wanted my brand description to be? So in that scenario, it may have been I want to come across as confident, approachable, trustworthy, uh, authentic, and sincere. So you want to remind yourself of what your end goal is. And then the other thing that I often suggest with people is don't make too many assumptions straight out of the gate because the reality is the everyone who's coming into work and they're sitting around the boardroom table or they're sitting in front of their screens there's a life behind that face there's a life behind that business title there's a life behind that i'm the ceo of blah 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 there's somebody who might have a sick child at home they might have a sick parent at home Maybe they had a little, a little case of road rage on the way into the meeting. Uh, maybe someone's going through a bit of a sticky divorce. I mean, we bring all of our identities into the workplace with us. Mm -hmm. So if there's something cooking, then it's going to be seen on, on that person's face. 
So that's the other thing. Don't don't assume it's about you, because in many cases, it's generally not. Right. And the uh, the other obvious technique is to simply stop and check in with folks and say, OK, we've covered a good chunk of content so far. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions or concerns before we move on? Because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Right. Right. Now, in doing that, in doing that, you also have to play with the eye contact as well. You have to if if that that lady in the back left hand corner is is the person I'm working for and she is the one I'm it's got me a little nervous, then I might look at somebody in the back right and I might say, folks, I've offered a lot of information. Any thoughts before we keep going? And then I'm going to share my eyes with a few other people around the room in the front and in the back and then in the front left. And then I might go back to her. But I'm not going to look at her and say, any thoughts, questions, concerns, anything you want to tell me? <laughs> right. Like what? that's going to make it weird and awkward for her. <laughs> why do you look like such a sourpuss? <laughs> that's right. I'm like, I th- honestly, Brian, I was like, do I look like your husband's mistress or what <laughs> is happening here? Like this woman was just, she was on my tail. Yeah. So. And, yeah. and you know what? I never knew what happened and I'll never know. And it doesn't matter because in, in reality, the tough audiences make you better. Yes, absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you felt the same way, too. In, in some of those really tough presentations, you had to up your game because you had to. Yeah. And I mean, on a side story that adds to that was I was once uh, we misunderstood a client's request and Mm. we came in and completely pitched a completely different solution for a problem they didn't even have. And (laughs) and um, and after uh, the pitch, the client called me up and was like, oh, my God, like, how did you get it so wrong? And I was blindsided that we'd gotten it so wrong. And um, but the end result was, she said, but they were so impressed with your thinking and your your your, you know, what you came up with around this problem we didn't have. They were so excited to have you come back and pitch us on the actual problem we have. <laughs> and they invited us back to pitch again and we won the business. But it was But again, it was like if we hadn't just been ourselves and been our authentic selves, Mm. that would have just crashed and burned and been a horrible, horrible experience. Um, Yeah. So that that's that's very valid and very good advice. Just be yourself and be authentic and make sure you leave them with the brand that you wanted to leave them with. And the big win there, too, Brian, which I don't want you to to miss, is the fact that they looked forward to you coming back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. True. You know, you know, people who don't love presenting and I get it. Not everyone's going to love it. You know, I still get nervous. In fact, I get nervous when I don't get nervous because that tells me that I'm not on my toes and that I might be taking this skill for granted in a way. But you want to be somebody who when you're next on the agenda People are like, oh, my God, I love when Brian presents. He's fun. He's easy. He keeps it light. He gets the point. You want to be somebody. You want to be a brand that people look forward to seeing and to listening to and connecting with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, bigger than that, you know, your brand becomes the thing that other people also want to be associated with. I mean, years ago when I started, Now, I've been doing this for over 20 years solo for just over 10. And when I first went solo, of course, you do what any, you know, sad little, you know, starter entrepreneur does, which is you reach out to your network of family of friends and say like, hey, (laughs) I'm putting up my own shingle, (laughs) considering hiring me or do you know anyone who would who would benefit from this type of service or, you know, that type of thing. I had been invited by a distant cousin of mine who was then the head of one of the regions of of a, a very large furniture, office furniture company. And this gentleman was so well liked throughout the company globally 
that the moment I walked in, and there was, of course, the chitty chat of how's this and how's that, and did you find the office okay, and how did you come to know this this company, and and I would say, well, so and so is a distant cousin and and a good family friend, and. Before I could get to the end of the sentence, people generally had their hand on their heart and they said, oh, my God, I love him. He is such a good man. So all of a sudden, I look good because he was the one that brought me in. Right. So this is where this whole brand extension and and how who you are and who you're connected with this, it's all about reputation, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the other piece of how you you want to be known as somebody who's, you know, somebody who's easy to chat with and connect with and and get to the point or whatever is important to you in your network. Welcome back. I'm talking with executive coach Shona Prasad on how our boardroom communication skills and style are taught around our kitchen tables and the significance of effective communication on creating psychological safety in our work environments. As I often say to clients, who you are around the boardroom table had everything to do has everything to do with who you were around the kitchen table. So what were some of the messages that you got as you were sitting having dinner with family? I know in my house it was, you know, my father, again, small town. I'm the youngest of five kids, large Irish Catholic family. And humility is a big value for my father. And he would often suggest to us warmly you know, not not to talk about yourself too much because mm-hmm. that shows an arrogance and that shows something that <clears throat> you're assuming that other people want to know things about you that they haven't asked. So, you know, I joke that my father is both impressed and somewhat horrified with what I do for a living because I'm I'm helping people feel comfort in self-promoting and and not self-promoting for the sake of self-promoting, but self-promoting for the benefit of helping the other side understand the value that they can bring and the contribution that they can bring to a company or a role or a team or whatever. So it's those little messages that we get along the way, again, at the kitchen table and little messages that we got throughout school and from teachers and from peers and, you know, moments throughout high school, because as I said, you bring all of your identities to work with you. Mm-hmm. You know, when we see somebody who's sitting around the boardroom table and and perhaps they are somebody who's really easygoing one-on-one, but when they're, they're in a larger format, they somewhat turn into somebody else. You know, uh, I, I don't want to say this is truth, and I certainly don't want to make any big claims here. But I often find that people who, you know, are either single children or they come from a smaller network of family, they're potentially not as big and bold as someone who comes from a larger network or they have extended family or they have family from overseas. You know, you see difference in, in, in cultural differences as well, as far as different cultures that are very comfortable being big and loud. And if anything, they have to work on attuning their style to the style of their audience in the effort to better connect. Because if I'm speaking to an audience that is quiet and I'm going in with a big, bold attitude, that's going to be a swing and a miss. Right. You know, you want to connect with people where they're at. So there's, there's really a lot of things to consider when you're when you're working with a team of people and working within a company culture that is important for not only the the culture overall but even just the culture of your team there's a lot of talk around psychological safety right now which i'm thrilled it's finally getting some airtime because i think it's always been that thing that when teams work or they jive or something's happening, but no one can really put their finger on what that thing is, it's psychological safety. 
Mm-hmm. So the idea of psychological safety is, is can you offer an idea without feeling as though you're going to be ridiculed or that people are, are going to say, well, that's a dumb idea or whatever the case may be. And we see statistically in very highly productive teams, there is a level of psychological safety. So if we can take that idea of psychological safety and start to look at what some of the cultural habits are and some, some of what the cultural norms are within that team and spread that out into other um, business units and then potentially at large, then we're starting to build culture around our communication. And that has a big role in the overall company brand as well. So, you know, it's really all about communication habits, whether it's you're coming from the kitchen table to the boardroom table. What are the habits? What are the messages? What are the habits that work? What are the habits that don't work that you need to rejig in order to move forward personally or within the company? I love the conversation around psychological safety because, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, it's becoming more of a concern, but it's still got a long way to go in the business world. And as, you know, the, from the top down, bottom up, as people start to understand that that's the, that's the key, the key to success is creating that, I can totally understand the value of someone like yourself coming in and helping people communicate in a way that creates psychological safety because that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't even understand. I mean, I know with myself personally, there are times I have said and done things in front of staff or in front of um, a group of people that has come across wrong and you don't even know that you've done it. And two, you know, it's it's almost counterproductive to what I call the 50s way of managing people, which is kind of like just bark orders and get them to do what you want them to do, which creates, you know, no psychological safety. And so you've kind of got these people that are balancing both, right? They're, you know, they're trying to grow a business yeah. and make it successful. And it's kind of counterintuitive to how they were trained and how they were brought up and et cetera, because they were just demanded to to do things. And so, yeah, I find that I could talk for hours about that with you, I'm sure. Yeah, I know. I'm really excited about that piece of it because, you know, I think it's, again, I I don't want to position myself as as a, as a, you know, cross generational communication expert or, or, or anything of that sort. But I think there's a couple things happening. I think there's, there's the workforce is changing and evolving and thus our communication is changing with it. And that's all very necessary and exciting by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's also changing. Each generation is also changing what they want and need in communications. So if you look at those two pieces, the other uh, counterintuitive thing that's also happening is, is number one, we're seeing more productivity and more clear, connected communications within teams and companies who have greater psychological safety. And then we're also seeing greater productivity, I might even say to a fault because we're risking burnout, with what's happening with people working from home, which is something that generations before would never dream Mm -hmm. of letting people work from home. Well, I can't see them. I don't know if they're working. I don't know if they're producing and outputting and hitting goals. Well, Mm -hmm. guess what? They are because they have a certain sense of autonomy and they don't have a monkey on their back, which gives them a sense of control and, and, passion around their work because they can do what they want and need to do and see fit to do. And now management is saying, oh, this is working. So if I give them, if I back off a bit, then that's the way to do it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the Netflix thing where it's like, you know, you can have as much vacation as you need, right? You just have to get your job done. If you went back 20 years and told people that, that you're, you know, they would go like you're crazy. You go to an insane asylum, you know, but meanwhile, it works. A hundred percent. And people are happier. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, and, 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 and happy people are obviously going to produce. So yeah, go with happy. Like what a, what a, what a, you know, a novel idea, keep you people happy. <laughs> and so your website is Glenwood Inc. I N C dot com. So G L E N W O O D I N C dot com. If anybody wants to reach out to you, I think that would be a great start. But one of the things I just wanted to end on is when I was on your website and I scroll down to the bottom and this is where you were describing how you want people <laughs> to feel and not be perfect all the time or whatever. And then what's at the bottom of your website is just such <laughs> yeah, Shona kind of statement that just gives a little bit of an insight into who you are and how you approach the world. And it's <laughs> it's that picture and it says anyway, it says punch today in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that's me, Brian. <laughs> I I've also been known to to uh to give a rock and roll kick after a high level executive really gets what I'm saying and gets my coaching and we really nail that moment. I have been known to to throw out a couple of rock and roll kicks in in uh, in boardrooms and I'm not afraid to admit it. So with that in mind, anybody out there who feels like they could have or need some help in personal communication skills so they can punch today in the face, reach out to <laughs> Shona, connect, have a conversation. Because like this conversation today, I think you have so much to offer people when it comes to personal, authentic communication. Shona, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Always fun chatting, Brian. Thank you so much for taking this time. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Well, that's another episode of Listen In. Thanks for being. Please subscribe, leave comments, or head on over to our website at listeninpod.com. That's listen with two N's, pod.com, where you'll find episode notes, links to anything that we talked about in this episode, and you can connect with us about being a guest on Listen In.